know that you know that you're in the atrial side, like you are on this side. Then you go to the LAO, and then the LAO will tell you if you're on the right side or on the left side. So again, here on the LAO view, you cannot tell if you are atrial or ventricular. I think with the experience you can tell, but like commonly, like that just tells you like if you are medial or lateral, if you are close to the septum, away from the septum, close to the septum on the left side, that away from the septum, or if you are in the coronary sinus, which is the posterior aspect. These are the common two views that we use all the time in the, in the EP lab. So if you project the two, uh, the, two uh, the, the catheter position in the two views, so this is your, this is your, uh, okay. So this is your uh, RAO view. This is your RAO. So this is like the catheter is going through the coronary sinus. This is a catheter that's going through to the right ventricle. This is a catheter that's going into the HIS, and this is the RA catheter. Now, if you go into LAO, so you see like the right ventricular catheter here, like it's well like displayed in front of you. So you can see that this is the atrium, this is the ventricle that's coming through the IVC and it's like displayed in a full length in, in front of you. But if you go into LAO, the, the RV catheters get shortened and you can see that the septal, the, the HIS catheter is actually facing you. And that tells you that you are in the LAO. You can see that like your coronary sinus catheter is well, this, like it's uh, like in full display into the coronary sinus. So these are the common views. So this is like your RAO. This is like the, the HIS catheter is close to the HIS region, which is the anterior lower septum. This is your coronary sinus, the coronary sinus catheter. And sometimes it can be quite foreshortened, but the clue is the RV catheter is like is very well displaced without any foreshortening and your right atrial catheter. And the LAO, the different like the coronary sinus is well displaced. The CS and the RV catheters are kind of foreshortened because they are coming toward you. So they are foreshortened. So we all know this. This is like your simple ACG. And when it comes to the intracardiac tracings, what we do is just like we are just spreading this ECG. Like if you are, if you're doing your ECG at a paper speed of 25 meter per second, we're doing it like, let's say at 200 meter per second. So we are just spreading the ECG like into like, a, like we're just like spreading the, the, the P and the QRS complexes and we add few catheters on top of it so we can see the exact progression of the electrical activity within the heart. So, so this like, so the impulses start like at your SA node. This is like a normal sound speed. So the impulses start at the SA node and which, cath which catheter is closer to the SA node? it's like your high right atrial catheter. And like in this example, so this is like your catheter in the atrium, which is high right atrial catheter. This is your P wave. And at the beginning of the P wave, you see a signal there because the impulse is started there. Then the impulse will spread through the right atrium into the septal region where you have the his bundle catheter. So a big, and as I, if you remember, I said that the his bundle catheter is close is in a unique location. It measure it. It records atrial signal. It records ventricular signal, and it records his bundle signal. And because the impulses are coming from the high rate atrium into the lower part of the right atrium, you will record an atrial signal. And if you see, you will record an atrial signal. Start at the SA node. You recorded something in the high rate atrium, and then. The next, the next uh, catheter uh, that sees electrical activity is your HES bundle catheter. You can see the atrial signal. And then the, you see this very sharp deflection that you see only at the HES bundle catheter. And this is like the HES bundle signal. This is why we place the catheter in this location because that tells us that the impulses are going this way. And it's not using any other shortcut to get to the ventricle. And then once it reaches the Hespandal catheter, the impulses will go through the Hesperkinji system and, and the ventricle gets activated. And once the ventricle gets activated, you see a ventricular signal at your right ventricular catheter, at the Hespandal catheter, and also you see your QRS at the same time. So it's like it's just very simple, but I think knowing the location of the channels, of the different channels, 
and having like a more of a mental image of where these catheters are positioned, this will help you a lot. So as a common approach, when you look at EGMs, like I think just like as a simple approach, you just want to orient yourself. You want to look at the surface ECGs and you also you want to look at the channels provided. And I'll explain things to you. And then once you know like the, the layout of the, of the picture in front of you, then you can look at the rhythm itself. You can, you, you can say this is like an ambient rhythm, like let's say a sinus beat, a tachycardia, a bradycardia, then you see if you are pacing because what we do in the electrophysiology during electrophysiology study we observe normal ambient conduction like a normal like normal rhythm and then we stress the rhythm with different form of pacing with my with the medication just to pinpoint the arrhythmia mechanism and then we apply it that's what we do so let's take this tracing so you just want to orient yourself from the beginning so at the beginning you have your surface ECGs you have one, two, and V1. And these are like the common ECGs that we used to, uh, that used to uh, plot during our electrophysiology study because V1 usually tells us if it's a right bundle or left bundle. One and two tell us like, uh, one tells you the vector from right to left and two tells you the vector from like anterior versus posterior. So this is what we usually utilize, one, two, and, and, v, and V1. But like different labs use different uh, different uh, uh, different leads, and then the, usually most of the labs will 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 project the channels this way. So the top you have your high right atrial catheter, which is this one. Then the HES bundle catheter, and, and usually people will display two channels because it has two different bipoles. One two, as if you remember, one two is always the distal bipole. Uh, bipole. So one, two is the distal HES, and three, four is the proximal HES. And then the next come the coronary sinus catheter. The coronary sinus usually start with the proximal coronary sinus because this tells you the, about the septum. This tells you about the septum. So CS910 is also close to the septum. And then you go from CS910 all the way to the CS12. And lastly, at the bottom, usually you have your, uh, your, your RV catheter. So if you look at the impulses, so if you look at the channels, this is your P wave. Like you did not expect your P wave to be this, like this broad and slow, but like just remember, like we are spreading like the paper speed. So this is your P wave. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry guys. So this is your P wave. So a P wave starts here at the high rate atrium. The first catheter that will record any signals is going to be your HRA, and you start at the HRA. Then next, impulses are going to go this way. It's going to go from like it's going to it's going to depolarize both, both atria. So the first part, like here, that's like uh, the first the first catheter of the septum. Uh, it's going to be your HES catheter. So your HES one, two, and three, four will record the atrial signal. And then if you see the coronary sinus, the impulses will start at CS910. It's going to go all the way to 12. So if this is your uh, atrial signal, so you start at 910. It's going to go all the way to CS12. And then, like at the same time, like the impulses did not stop only at the A. Uh, like at the same time, the impulses from the A will go to the HESP on the region. And then you will record your... HES catheter, the HES, the HES signal or the HES bundle catheter. Then once you reach the ventricle, you will uh, get like your V signal at the HES at the RV and you will get your QRS at the same time. Any questions? Hello? Thank you, boss. Clear. Things are good. So should I keep going? Is it too yes, fast? Sir. Is it a good pace or no? No. Uh, I think it's uh, reasonable, reasonable speed. Okay, perfect. So we'll keep going. Thank you. Okay, then uh, common measurements. Oh, how do I close this? Oh, sorry. So the common measurements. So, sorry. Sorry, guys. Okay. So 
the things that you really need to know as a cardiology trainee, like I think when I like, um, so when it comes to like when we did our Royal College exam, we were not supposed to know these. Like I don't, I don't think that like it was part of the uh, the Royal College objectives for the uh, for the exam. But like you know, every every uh, exam body have different views, and I think here in Saudi you are expected to know some basics of electrophysiology study. And I will be very surprised if they're going to ask you something outside this slide. So there are like some common measurements that we always measure. We measure the A to H interval, the H to V intervals, and then we do some pacing maneuver, ventricular pacing and atrial pacing. And I'm going to show you some arrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias that you guys need to know. And that's it. So when it comes to the common intervals, the two intervals that we measure is the A to H interval and then the H to the V interval. So the A to H interval, the one thing that I want you to remember, A H interval is a local interval. It tells you about the speed of conduction within the AV node. So you measure it because it's a local interval, you measure it at the Hess bundle catheter. So, so the, the way that you measure the A H interval, so you measure it like at the Hess bundle catheter, either the Hess 1, 2 or 3, 4 proximal or distal, and you start from the beginning or the sharpest component of the A to the sharpest component of the HES. That's your AH interval. So as I mentioned, it is a local interval. It, it is measured at the HES bundle catheter because the HES bundle catheter is where you see the HES bundle, the HES bundle signal. And it's from the sharpest A to the sharpest HES signal. And usually it's from 55 to 125. That's your AH interval. So then the HV interval, and the mistake that a lot of people make, even cardiologists, even electrophysiologists, I see this mistake made all the time because people think that they know how to measure it. And uh, believe me, a lot of people measure it wrong. So if you think about the AH interval, it was like a local interval, you measure it at the, measure it at the HES channel. So intuitively, you think that the HV interval is the same. It's from the HES to the V, at the HES channel, but, the, but the, uh, the proper way of measuring it, like you start from the HES, as you expected, but the V, you, it's from the beginning of the HES to any V. So what I mean by any V, this is how you su you're supposed to measure the, v, the HV interval. You draw a line on the HES, and then you draw a line on the, all the Vs, and you see where, where is the closest V or the earliest V, and if you see here, probably the earliest V is the QRS, or the same time, like it's the RV catheter. It is not the HES channel V. This is how you measure your HV interval, and I'm going to explain to you why. Why it is very important to measure the HV this way. Because the normal, the, as I mentioned, the HV is not a local interval. It's from the sharpest HES to any ventricular signal. Normally, it's from 35 to 55. It can be very short in the setting of pre-excitation. So if we have an HV less than 35, sometimes the HV can be negative, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, that tells you that the patient probably have a manifest accessory pathway or a WBW with the common with the WW, WBW pattern with the common wording that uh, everyone uses. And if it is too long, that tells you that the patients have an advanced conduction disease. And if it gets more than 70 or close to 100 milliseconds, that's the sign that someone is the a pacemaker. So why it is important to measure the HV interval this way? So just imagine that you have an accessory pathway, an accessory pathway that conducts from the atrium to the ventricle. So this is your accessory pathway. So this accessory pathway will bypass your AV node and your HES signal. So let's say you have a sinus beat. So the sinus beat comes in and it bypasses the, bypasses the AV node into the ventricle. And the ventricle gets activated before the HES channel or probably like at the same time. It's more or less like of a race. So then if you want to measure your, your HV interval, so let's look at this electrogram. So uh, like you, at the beginning, you start like by orienting yourself. You have your surface CCGs. Uh, surface ECG, you have lead one, two, and V1. 
Then if you see the RV has been moved to the top, HRA is here. This is your HES, distal and proximal, and that's your primary sinus. So you start by having like, uh, so you start like this is like your P wave. So uh, yes, so this is like your P wave. Your P wave is here. This is your high rated, like uh, uh, the high rated atrial catheter. And you see this is like your atrial signal at the HES. And this is your HES. This is like the sharpest deflection at the HES. That's the HES bundle signal. And that's your ventricular signal. And you can see like your ventricular signal also like in the RV apex. So if you want to measure your HV, so you drop a line on the HES. So that's like your HES signal. And then you drop a line on all the Vs. And if you see, probably like here is like is easy because the earliest V happened to be at the, uh, happened to be uh, most likely at the beginning of the QRS complex. Uh, but like at the same time, the V was okay. Like if you, uh, like it's at the same time at the HES, uh, at the HES, uh, at the HES channel too. But this is the proper way of measuring it. So this is your HES and you put a line and you draw like, and you measure the interval to the beginning of the QRS complex. And that's your HV. And here, if you measure your HV, the HV here is very short because the ventricle got activated through the accessory pathway before it got the normal delay at the HES channel. So that's why you have like an HV interval of being short because the ventricle has been pre-excited through the accessory pathway. So if you see a short HV interval, that tells you that you have an accessory pathway. So the other possibility, if you remember, I said that the HV can be negative. Sometimes the impulse goes, goes through the accessory pathway very rapidly and activates the whole ventricles before it even reaches to the HES. And then you will see the HES signal is within the QRS complex. That tells you that like, you have a negative HV or an HV sometimes of zero or negative. That tells you that the ventricle has been pre-excited by a, by a pathway that is not through the AV node and it's, all, it's, it, and it's, it's only like for your knowledge, it's, uh, that's a sign that you have a manifest pre-excitation or you have an accessory pathway that conducts from the atrium to the ventricle. Makes sense? Yes. Okay, so keep going. So then ventricular pacing, so, so when it comes to ventricular pacing, so what we do in the electrophysiology study, because like we, we look for HV interval at baseline to tell us if we have a pathway that conducts from the atrium to the ventricle, but sometimes the pathways, accessory pathways can be present and they don't conduct from the atrium to the ventricle. They only conduct from the ventricle to the atrium. So they only, the, some of the pathways are only capable of what we call retrograde conduction. So, and this, this is something that you cannot see on a surface ECG. So we do the pacing to know where, how is the conduction spreads from the ventricle to the atrium. So, so here, like again, orient yourself. So this is your surface ECG. So you have one, two, V1, and here also we have V6. We have uh, an RV catheter at the top, HRA. Then we have the HES distal, proximal, and we have the coronary sinus, and they took off like CS910 here for whatever reason. So now, is this ambient rhythm or this is pacing? This is like, I just want to be familiar with this. This is the pacing artifact. So like if we are pacing from a channel, you will see this pacing artifact, like it's more like a square. And you can see the pacing stimulus like on the surface ECG. So this is your right ventricular channel and you're pacing from the right ventricle. So when we pace from the right ventricle, you wanna see how the impulses spread from the pacing site to the atrium. So the impulses, like in a normal person, we expect the impulses to go only through the AV node because it's the only channel that connects from the ventricle to the atrium. So like in this, in this situation, so you're pacing from the ventricle, this is like the pacing stimulus output, and then the impulses goes through the Hesperkinji system back to the atrium. So if the impulses goes through the AV node or, the or through the AV node 
where would you expect the earliest atrial signal? You would expect the earliest atrial signal at the his bundle catheter because we know that the his bundle catheter is positioned in a unique position that it will, re that it will record the latest atrial signal and the earliest ventricular signal. So uh, this is like this is the latest atrial if you if you're going anti-gradely, but like if you're going retrogradely and you have a no you have and you don't have any accessory pathways, your earliest signal has to be at the HES. So if you see here, your your Excuse me, Dr. Fahad. I think we don't hear you anymore. No voice anymore. The issue with the sound, Doctor. خلص البرزنتيشن ولسه <تصفيق> ممكن تتصل عليه تليفون الله يحفظه شغال يشرح وشكله شغال يشرح Hello, Dr. Tudor. Hello, Dr. Tudor. I really don't know what's going on. Although I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. So here, like, what, uh, like, um, what, what we are doing, like, we're pacing. Uh, uh, someone is, uh, okay, it's okay. Perfect. So, like here we're pacing from the ventricle and we're looking for the earliest atrial signal and that tells us like what's the condition of the retrograde conduction. And if you see here, like you are pacing in the V and these are like your atrial signals. These are like the sharp atrial signal because these are the Vs and these are your As. This is an A, this is an earlier A, this is the earlier A, this is an earlier A, but the earliest is actually at the HES. So you, and also like this is your HRA, which is like the latest. So you know that your conduction is going up through the AV node. This is what we call concentric atrial activation. So that tells you that the patient does not have an accessory pathway that conducts from the ventricle to the atrium. Clear? Clear. Okay, perfect. So let's take this scenario. Like here, you have an accessory pathway close to the distal coronary sinus, like it's more of the left side of the accessory pathway. Again, look at your surface, like uh, your EGM, like orient yourself. This is one V1, RV, HRA. This is your HIS, and this is your coronary sinus. Are you pacing, or this is an ambient rhythm? You're actually pacing, and you're pacing at the right ventricle. So now let's look, where is your earliest atrial activation? You know that you're conducting in the A, because you can see an atrial signal here. But is this the earliest? No. If you look at the HIS, is the HIS the earliest? No. If you look at your coronary sinus, there is something earlier here, something is earlier here, and something is even earlier here. Or also, if you go into the distal coronary sinus, it's actually earlier. So what is happening is actually like the impulses are going through both ways. But it, like as I, as, you, as I mentioned before, it's always a competition, and the pathway will always beat the AV node into the atrium. So the earliest atrial signal uh, is actually at the distal coronary sinus, 
So that tells you that uh, the patient uh, is not conducting through the AV node, and the patient is actually conducting through a pathway. And, the, and that tells you also the location of the pathway, because if the earliest signal is here, the pathway has to be here. So when we are looking to ablate this pathway, we actually go and put our ablation catheter close to this area because this is the earliest atrial activation that is eccentric and it has to be the location of the pathway. Makes sense? Yes. Okay, perfect. So then what the, we do also atrial pacing. We do two different forms of atrial pacing. But I think the more informative for you guys is what we call atrial extras. So this is what I mean by that. So here, again, like you see like different channels, like and you get confused, take a step back, orient yourself. You have one, two, V1, HRA, S, CS prox, CS testal, and RV. Is this ambient rhythm oral pacing? If you see, we have the spacing stimulus output. You see also on the surface ECG that we are pacing. So we're pacing in the HRA. So if you see the pattern of pacing here, so if you look at the interval from this to this, from this to this, from this to this, it looks like it's very stable. But like then all of a sudden, we are throwing an earlier beat. This is what we call a drivetrain with an extra. This is what we call, we call this as S1s. The drivetrain like is six to eight beats just to like uh, make the conduction more homogeneous inside the heart. So we do uh, S1, 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 and this is what we call S2. It's almost like you are trying to make a premature atrial contraction. So the way that we do uh, this like premature or the S or like, uh, or the, uh, or like the premature pacing in the, uh, or what sometimes we call it atrial extras in the HRA, this is how we do it. So we do our pacing train, let's say at 600 milliseconds. So we do the pacing train and with every pacing train, we measure the AH interval. So let's say like here we're pacing, we're pacing at the HRA, so S1, and we measure the AH to H interval. Let's say it's a 100 milliseconds. And then we do the second pace, uh, 600 milliseconds after, and we measure the AH interval. And then 600 milliseconds after, like we, uh, we pace again and we measure the AH interval. Then we did our train. Now we want to do the extras. So let's say we throw the extra at like at 400 milliseconds. Like if you know, this is what we call the extra stimulus or the HRA. And, like, and because the beat is arriving early at the AV node, the AV node will have like, a, it will have, but something like a winky back, we call it decrement. So the, the conduction through the AV node is gonna slow. This is the conduction properties of the AV node. And the, and the lengthening of the PR interval that you guys see with the premature beat or the winky back phenomena, we see it here as lengthening of the AH interval. So this is like, so we did this with, and we brought the extra at 400 milliseconds. So now, like immediately after, we do it again. We start like with pacing like at 600. We measure the AH interval. It's more or less the same. And again, and like another S1 and another S1. Then now we bring the premature beat a little bit earlier. Rather than like 400 milliseconds, we bring it up at 380 milliseconds. And like what happens to the, to the AH conduction? It's going to prolong for a little bit. So the AH interval will go from 120, like when you're uh, doing the 400 extra, to 125. And then we do it again. So we, we again, 600, 600, and then we bring the extra beat a little bit like by 10 milliseconds shorter. And then all of a sudden, the AH interval goes from 125 up to 180. What is this phenomenon? This is what we call a jump. And I'll explain what we mean by the jump. So jump by definition is at least a 50 millisecond increase in the AH interval. So your AH interval went up from 125 to 180. So that's a 55 millisecond increase. With a 10 millisecond decrease in the S1 to S2 interval. So if you look at, this is the S1 to the S2 interval. Here it was 380. We went down by only 10 milliseconds. 
and the AH interval went up by 50 milliseconds. That tells you that you have a slow pathway. So why this is happening? So this is what's happening in this trace. So here, like you, this is our S1, and we measure the AH interval. S1, we measure the AH interval. Again, S1, and then we bring the beat like at S2, and then all of a sudden the AH blown up. And this is this is what actually happened. So when you are doing your drive train, so this is what happens with the impulse. So in your AV node, you everyone will have almost everyone will have a fast pathway and a slow pathway. So in normal conduction, the impulses will go through the fast pathway all the way down to the Hesperkinji system. So you see nothing of the slow pathway. Because what happens, impulses will break here, go down through the slow, and it takes its time. But at the same time, the distal end is engaged by the faster beat, and they collide in the middle of the slow pathway, so you see nothing. So this is what, what you see with the normal AH. The impulses goes through the fast pathway, and you see no sign of the slow pathway. But what happens when you throw the beat prematurely? So you block in the fast pathway, then the impulses go through the slow pathway, and then you get this prolongation of your AH interval. So the impulses have jumped from the fast to the slow. That's what we call the AH jump, and that tells you that you have, a, you have, a, you have the presence of a slow pathway. And why is this important? This is the precursor of AV node re-entry tachycardia. Because what could happen is, so like, let's, let's look at this tracing. So here, like orient yourself. So this is service ECGs, this is your HES, this is your RV, RA, and this is your coronary sinus. Here you're pacing at the HRA, and the, you, if you look at your AH, like uh, this is like the stem, this is your A, this is your H, and this is the S2 or the premature, and this is your A, this is your H. Look at how much is the jump. But like, well, the one thing that you see too is what is the signal? So here you're pacing at the HRA. So this is your pace in the HRA, this is a pace in the HRA, and then all of a sudden <clears throat> you see another signal at the HRA that that happens almost like at the same time at the ventricle uh, at the ventricular signal this so you had a jump then all of a sudden you have a signal in the right atrium so what actually happened is that the impulse that went down through the slow pathway and gave us this humongous ah interval went back up through the fast pathway and conducts back into the atrium this is what gives what we call an echo beat so you have a jump Impulses have jumped from integrally from the fast to the slow. Then the slow, by the time the slow reached here, the fast have recovered, and the impulses went back up and, and conducted to the atrium. So this is what we call an echo beat, and this is a one beat of AV node re-entry. So you have a re-entry within the AV node. You went down through the slow pathway, and you went up through the fast pathway. This is why this AH interval is important because this is what we usually see. This is how AV node re-entry tachycardia starts. So you get like a prolongation of the AH interval, impulses go down through the slow pathway, and then the same impulse will go back through the fast pathway, and then the tachycardia starts. So this is why this form of pacing is important because it tells us that the patient has, if the patient has tachycardia, that AV node re-entry is the most likely mechanism. Any questions? That's okay. Are we good? Yes. Okay. Nasser, it's, it's not only you. I just want to ask if everyone else is okay. Floor is open for everyone. That's fine. Come on, Doctor. Doctor. Grab it. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Nasser. I know you're for too long. That's that's why I, I keep picking on you. So. So this is what we call an echo beat. 
So the arrhythmias to know are bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias. So I like, it's like, like uh, 10 more minutes and I'll be done. So when it comes to the block, so the block from the atrium to the ventricle, the block can be benign and can be malignant. So let's look at this form of this, this tracing. Again, orient yourself. These are your surface ECGs, one, two, and V1. This is your RV, HRA, HIS, and CS. Is this native rhythm or are you pacing? You are actually pacing. You can see this pacing stimulus in the HRA. So you're, and if you see, like on the surface ECG, like you're also pacing too. So your pace in the HRA, you conduct to the V. Pace, you conduct to the V. Pace, you conduct to the V. And then like you brought this S2 or the premature beat earlier and you did not conduct to the V. So the question is, where is the level of the block? We look at the His bundle catheter. So if you look at the His bundle catheter, this is your stimulus, this is your A, and the sharpest signal is your H. Again, this is your A, and the sharpest signal is the H. Again, like this is your A, and the sharpest signal is the H. And then here, you see an A with no His. So the block happened at the proximal part of the AV or the block happened within the AV node. And that tells you with a premature beat and a block happening within the AV node, that tells you that this form of block is B9 and the patient does not need a pacemaker. And this, we see this almost, almost like at every AP study. The pathological block that, that is really scary is this one. So this is like from a paper because I couldn't find, uh, mm -hmm. find an, an infrahesian block in, like in my collection. But like just again, orient yourself. So this is a surface ECG. And you see that the QRS complex is relatively wide. And this is a, like a P wave. And there is probably like another P wave here. If you're not sure, you look at your, uh, the other channel. This is your HRA and this is your HES. So you know you have two QRSs and you have four A's. So you have two to one conduction. So this one conducts, this one is blocking. This one conducts, this one is blocking. <clears throat> so the question is, where is the block happening? So let's look at the HES channel. So here, this is your A. The sharp part is the HES. And this is your V. Okay, so that's good. Let's look at the, the, the beat that blocked. So this is your A, this is your HES, and there is no V. Again, it's the same pattern that happens here. That tells you that the block is distal at the conduction system. And that this is like a very bad sign that this patient is at a very high risk of developing complete heart block and the patient needs a pacemaker. This is an, a form of infrahesian block. We rarely see this because we rarely do uh, EP studies for bradycardia. If you have any, like pacemakers are so easy and uh, I, I want to say that like 99% like of the time, if you put a pacemaker, it goes without any consequences. So no one actually does bradycardia study anymore. But like this is, a, this is like a, a slide that they love to put up in the exam, uh, just like a form of emphysium block. So the difference between this and the other tracing is here you have an A and no His. So the block is proximal within the conduction system. And that is usually B9, but like here, the block is very distal because it's happened after you recorded your HIST channel and the patient is at a very high risk of developing complete heart block. And that's an indication to put a pacemaker. Okay. <clears throat> so when it comes to tachyrhythmias, so when it comes to tachyrhythmias, so I just want to show you two tachyrhythmias that, you, that they, they love to ask about in the exams. So let's look at this tracing. So I know like it's a lot of signals. Just step back and orient yourself. So surface ECGs, one, two, and V1. This is your HRA. This is your HIS. And this is your coronary sinus uh, catheter, distal to proximal. And this is your RV. Is this ambient rhythm or pacing? If you look at the surface ECG, I don't see any pacing, stim pacing artifacts. And if you see also like at the rest of the channels, it's not actually pacing. This is tachycardia. So it's a narrow 
complex tachycardia, does this tachycardia, so when we see a narrow complex tachycardia, the, the question that we look for is, where is the earliest atrial activation? So let's see, so this is like a tachycardia, and do we see an A with every V? So this is a V, and this is an A. This is a V, this is an A. A V and an A, a V and an A. And these are all ventricular channels. So let's say, so now the question is, where is the earliest atrial signal? Is it here? No, no, no. It is actually here. So this is your earliest atrial signal. So your earliest atrial signal is in CS1234. So what does that tell you? It's exactly the same as what we discussed with ventricular pacing. So what is actually happening here? So impulses are going down through the AV node. How do you know that the impulses are going down through the AV node? Because you see a HES signal. So this is your A. This A conducts to the HES. And then the HES conducts to the V. And then the impulses has to go back to the atrium through a pathway. Why we say through a pathway? Because what will, like, what, there is like no normal reason that you have the earliest atrial signal during a tachycardia at CS12. This is almost like ventricular pacing. We're almost like the pacing in the ventricle. So, and you see that the earliest signal at CS34. So this has to be an AV re-entry, uh, like or AVRT. So here, impulses go down through the AV node because you see like you have a HES activation and then ventricle gets activated. Then the atrium, it's a re-entry, so the atrium has to get engaged and how is the ATM being engaged? It's being engaged uh, first at CS1234. So that tells you that the patients have a pathway here. The patient have an AV re-entry tachycardia. Any question? They love to bring this up during the exam. They just love it. I don't know why. Is it an accessory pathway? Yes, that's an accessory pathway. Exactly. So you have an accessory pathway. So but like, this is like how AVRT presents. We always think about like AVRT, like, a, like accessory pathway as like a pre-excitation, but the majority of the tachycardias are actually, the pathway is being used in a retrograde fashion. So they will present with a narrow complex tachycardia. It's narrow because impulses go down from the A to the V through the Hesperkinji system. So the QRS complex is narrow. But the, because it's a re-entry, the impulses have to go back to the atrium, and the way it go back, goes back to the atrium is through the accessory pathway. This is like AVRT. This is accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. Okay. You Any mean orthodromic AVRT, orthodromic? This is the typical one. This is the typical orthodromic. Antidromic is rarer. Uh, so the other format. So the antidromic. The impulses goes down to the accessory pathway and goes up the AV node. But what would you expect the epicurus complex to look like? Will it be narrow or wide? It will be wide. Yeah, exactly, because that's a different. And here, is it narrow or wide? This is narrow. So no. this is a narrow complex tachycardia. And also, <clears throat> okay, let's, the other question, because you brought that up. If you have an antidromic tachycardia, what would you expect your HV to be? Normal, short? Short. It, it should be short. And if here, if you measure your HV, your HV is probably going to be normal. Clear. OK. Next. So then the last, the last tachycardia that you guys need to know, we, we talk about it briefly. It's like is your AV node re-entry. So you have a PAC that blocks in the fast pathway, goes through the slow pathway, the slow pathway <coughs> goes up through the fast, and then you have a re-entry circuits within the AV node. And the key about the AV node re-entry, so, so if you go, let's go back for a second. So here, for the tachycardia, for the impulse to go, for the tachycardia to continue, so the A 
have to conduct to the V, and then the V have to conduct to the A. So the A and the V are not going to be contracting at the same time. So it's almost like a bing pong. So the A have to give it to the V, and the V have to give it back to the A. So that will give you usually a longer VA. So one of the features that we look at in EP study is the VA timing, and the V to the earliest A is relatively long. But like, let's think about AV node re-entry. It's a re-entry within the AV node. So the re-entry is happening within the AV node, and the impulses are given to the A and to the V at the same time. Because it's a re-entry within the AV node, impulses shoot both sides at the same time. So how is that helpful in, uh, when we look at the EGMs? So again, let's look at this. This is a narrow, this is like, let's, we oriented ourselves, surface, RV, HRA, HIS, and CS. So this is a narrow complex tachycardia with, do you see an A with every V? So this is a V, the RV apex. You see an A with an every V. So now the question is, where is the earliest A? So if you draw a line, so you see this A is early, but if you see earlier than it, like is the coronary sign, is the, sorry, is the Hiss. So the Hiss is the earliest. This is our all Vs. But like, you see like the, the very sharp part, this is the earliest A. So the earliest A is at the AV node. So the, the retrograde conduction, the way that the impulses breaks into the atrium is through the AV node. But like, how early is this? If you draw a line on the earliest A, because this is your Hiss, this is your V, it's the same time as your RV catheter, the earliest A is at the same time as the V. And that is not possible if, if, they, are, if they are activated in sequence. So they both have to be conduct, activated at the same time. And that only can happen for your level is only can happen with AV node re-entry. Because as I mentioned, it's a circuit within the AV node, both are activated at the same time. And if you see here, the V and the A are both activated at the same time. So this is the hallmark of AV node re-entry. So for us to diagnose AV node re-entry, we measure what we call the septal VA time. This is like the septal, what do we mean by the septal? We measure the septum or the Hiss signal VA time. And here the time from V to A is very short and typically it is less than 70 milliseconds or well, sometimes we call it A on V tachycardia. So the A on V tachycardia, this for your level is AV node re-entry tachycardia. So this is how AV node re-entry will present. It's the same as the echo beat that I showed you guys before, but like this is like more sustained echo, an echo after an echo after an echo. So this is AV node re-entry tachycardia. Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, if there is accessory pathway uh, near to the Hiss, would it be like okay. this or different? Uh, so it will, uh, that's a good question because let's take it back. So if it is an accessory pathway next to the Hiss, will the A and V be activated at the same time? So because if it's an accessory pathway, it's not a circuit within the AV load. So the A has to conduct to the V, and then the V has to conduct to the A. Will the VA time be this short? You tell me. The time would be a little bit more long. Longer, exactly. So that's the hallmark. So when you have the VA, if, like, so the earliest activation, as you mentioned exactly, so the earliest activation could be at the Hiss, if you have a pathway next to the Hiss, but the VA timing will never be this short. Because this is short, it's not because the proximity of the catheters. It is short because of the mechanism of the tachycardia. It's almost like a focus within the AV node, and the focus fires up to the atrium, down to the ventricle at the same time. So that's why the VA, it's not an actual timing. There is no interval between them. 
this is like just a, like a, a coincidence like that we're recording them at the same time. But like if you have an AV re-entry that's using a pathway close to the HES, so the A have to conduct to the V, V have to conduct to the A, so, the v, the, so they have to wait for each other, so the V to A will be longer. That's a good question. That's a really good question. Sorry, I have a question. Further. Uh, regarding this uh, vertical line uh, in comparison to the surface uh, ECG, okay. is this with the B wave or uh, with the QRS complex? Will you be able, so let's say, so what is the typical description of AV node re-entry on the surface ECG? The typical description is a narrow complex tachycardia that you see these and there is no P waves. Why there is no P waves? Because the P wave is hidden within the QRS complex. Sometimes you can see the hint of the P wave at the, at the end of the QRS complex. But like the line that I'm drawing, I'm drawing the line with the earliest atrial signal. So this is a hiss. That's your V, because at the same time as your RV apex catheter. And this is your uh, right atrial catheter, but you want to see the earliest. What we care about in arrhythmia is what is your earliest atrial signal. And here, the earliest atrial signal is at the HIS because this is distinct. This signal is distinct from this. This is your earliest A, and this is the A that I'm drawing a line on. So I'm drawing a line to the earliest A, which is here. And if you see the timing of the earliest A is within the QRS complex. So would you expect yeah. to see a P wave on the surface CCG? You may not, because the P wave is happening exactly at the same time as the QRS complex. The QRS complex is the bigger person. So you're not gonna see the tiny P because it's gonna be covered by the QRS. You see my point? Okay, thank you. Thank you, it's a clear. So, this is like just a summary slide. AH interval is a local interval that's measured at the HES channel. HV is from the HES to any V. If it's too short, pre excitation, too long, predicts hot block, pacing maneuver, we pace at the ventricle and we look for the earliest atrial activation. If the earliest at the AV node or the HES bundle catheter, we call it central. If it's somewhere else, most likely at the CS, we call it eccentric. Atrial pacing, we do atrial extra stimuli, and that's the definition of the jump. And then the arrhythmias for you guys to know, it's AV node re-entry, it's a narrow complex, A on V, short timing, AVRT, it's a narrow complex, long VA, as I mentioned, like it's almost like a ping pong, and you have eccentric atrial activation. So I think this is what you guys need to know for the exam. Uh, it can be more complicated, uh, but this is like just like a simple uh, one-on-one uh, one -on -one introduction to electrophysiology physiology study. Any question? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, yeah. Um, just to clarify my concept about this, uh, when we were looking for a benign block, at the, late, at the level of bundle office, you mentioned that if uh, there is A but no V and no uh, no H and no V, so it means that this patient doesn't need a pacemaker. So it is Renke back type uh, block or uh, any exactly. what sort of block? This is exactly this is like more like a Renke back type block. Thank you. That's a Renke back type block. But I, oh, okay. I, to be honest, I don't like to say the Renke back because I can show you examples of an infrahessian block that looks like a winky back. But I think for you, this is like, uh, like as you mentioned, you see an A with no hiss, this is the B9 winky back type of block. Thank you, sir. 